everybody, I'm Celeste and I have a show called Yarn to Table which is all about my knitting life and we are doing a year-long cowl right now called the FiberQuest Cowl. Um, in the doobly-doo you can find a link to the Ravelry group and to uh, the playlist with the overview video on the cowl if you don't know. Um, but I'm recording this now to give you guys some information about goat fibers because for March and April we are journeying to the land of goats and we're all experimenting with uh, knitting with goat fiber. So this video is information for anyone taking part in the cowl or anyone else who is interested uh, to learn a little bit more about the goat fibers that we knit with, what distinguishes them from each other and from other fibers, um, how they're spun up into yarn, different fibers they're blended with, and what kinds of things they are suitable for. I think this is the most excited about goats I have ever been because this cow has been so much fun so far and I loved recording the video all about camelids for you guys. Um, Actually, I think this is probably the second most excited about goats I've ever been. <laughs> because when I was a kid, we had goats and um, one of them was pregnant and I went down to collect the eggs in the morning. Um, chicken eggs, obviously not goat eggs because that's not a thing. I don't know how much you guys know about goats, but you probably knew they didn't have eggs. Anyway, I was collecting the chicken eggs and um, and she had given birth and so I came down and suddenly there were two kids um, and the number of goats we had had gone from two to four and I met them for the first time and they were beautiful and it was awesome. So this is the second most excited I've been about goats in my life, everybody. <laughs> oh my God, I am a little bit loopy right now, sorry. So let's talk about goat fiber. Okay, when it comes to knitting, most of the goat fiber you're going to see is probably going to be either mohair or cashmere. And we're going to talk about mohair first. So mohair comes from the Angora goat. And I know it's a little bit confusing because there's an Angora rabbit that produces Angora fiber. However, they're just both named after the same place. Angora is an ancient term for uh, a city in Turkey, which I think is now called um, Ancona, but uh, it's just a regional thing, not a connection between the fibers, not a connection between the animals. The thing that makes it confusing though is when you're reading a fiber label for some yarn or clothing, if it says Angora, it's only talking about the rabbit. If you want Angora goat fiber, it will be labeled as mohair. So just to clarify, for the purposes of this cow, it's the land of goats. Don't be using anything that labels as Angora. It should label as mohair or as another type of goat fiber. If you do want to knit with Angora, which I suggest because it's lovely, uh, that would be perfect for the land of rare and precious jewels, which we will start up for November, December. So just keep that in the, in the queue and we'll get to it. Um, but mohair comes from Angora goats. So uh, I have my notes over here, by the way, so that's why I keep looking over here. Um, now, the idea of goats with silken hair uh, was kind of a myth dating all the way back to the 14th century BC, but today's Angora goats um, probably evolved from a breed that uh, originated in 13th century AD um, in the Ancona region of Turkey, which uh, is where they get the term Angora from, right? As I mentioned a second ago. Um, so today, however, about 60% of mohair is grown in South Africa. Um, and the next largest producer would be the United States. And most of our um, mohair is grown in Texas. Uh, shout out to Texas. That's where I was born. Um, now, mohair has only become easily available to knitters all over the world in about the last 50 years. So we are incredibly lucky to be knitting at this time on the planet. That is something I keep learning as I research different fibers is, you know, so many knitting traditions go back so long, but the fact that we have so much versatility in not only the styles of knitting, but also the fibers that we knit with, that is really something unique 
to living in the world at this time. And um, that along with Ravelry and the internet and getting to share knitting with knitters all over the world just daily makes me so excited to live in the world at this time, even though there are lots of other things that make this a difficult time to live. I, <laughs> I think as a knitter, it's obviously the time you go for. So a little diversion there, but I think that's interesting. Mohair, such a big part of knitters' lives today, and um, you know, probably your great-grandmother was not knitting with it. Okay, so mohair has some of wool's most desirable quali qualities, even though they're totally different animals, which is really cool. So like wool, um, mohair is flame retardant, um, soil resistant and can absorb a lot of moisture without feeling cold or damp. So those are some of the really excellent qualities about wool and mohair has those qualities as well. So that's really cool. Um, now it's also warmer and stronger than wool, uh, which is really neat. And it has a shine to it because it has larger, flatter scales. So as we talked about in the camelids episode, fi fibers from am animals sort of grow in these different spurts and they have these long sections that are called scales and they almost look like shingles on a roof. And the longer ones um, tend to create a more silky feel and they reflect light in a way that gives this lustrous appearance of shine. Um, so both alpaca and mohair are shinier than wool. Um, and uh, obviously like the smoothest, shiniest animal fiber of all is silk and that's because silk, not being an animal hair, doesn't have any scales at all. So, you know, the longer scales create a shinier, smoother fiber and the very longest one is gonna be none at all, which is silk. Um, but for our purposes, comparing things to wool, uh, like alpaca, mohair has a bit of a sheen to it. Um, well, mohair also absorbs dye very, very easily, and because of its lustrous look, it reflects the color of that dye back just really, really brilliantly. So a lot of hand dyers offer uh, a mohair blend for this reason, and it can be really gorgeous. Um, now, the softness, like with a lot of other fibers, really depends on the age of the animal and with mohair there are many different grades that you can get into so if you've had a bad experience with mohair in the past and you don't think it's very soft it might be because of the way it was spun and sort of fibers jumbling up and pointing in different places um, but it might be that you just weren't working with a young, uh, fiber from a young enough animal. So maybe give it another try. Maybe go to a local yarn store instead of ordering online. Kind of feel some different mohairs and um, see if maybe you're not as opposed to it as you thought you were. So the very softest mohair is called Super Fine Kid Mohair. And that is what it will say on the label. If it says anything else, it's not going to be Super Fine Kid Mohair because they would tell you if it were, because um, they can charge a premium for that. Now, Super Fine Kid Mohair is the actually the very first shearing of the goat. Only the first shearing at six months can be labeled Super Fine Kid Mohair. So that is really special stuff. This is some from my stash uh, that is labeled Super Fine Kid Mohair. This is Rowan Kid Silk Haze, which is a very common lace weight yarn. Um, that you will see and it is 70% mohair and 30% silk and it has this just gorgeous mohair halo to it and I love to use this yarn um, held double with another yarn to add uh, all of the lovely qualities that mohair has particularly that um, gorgeous halo which is probably the most obvious thing about mohair that everyone knows so um, I cannot personally speak to any mohair that is a lower grade than the Superfine Kid Silk, because in my very, you know, limited personal experience knitting with mohair, I've only knit with this. I've knit with it in different colors, but I've only knit with this. Um, so this is very soft, but um, you know, I understand if some of your experience with mohair might be with something that wasn't as soft. I recommend trying out some of the, the ones from Younger Animals. So, like I said, the Super Fine Kid Mohair, very first shearing. After that, from 
youngest to oldest and therefore softest to most coarse. You have various grades. Um, you've got kid mohair, um, yearling, fine adult, and then adult. And of course, if it only says mohair and it doesn't say anything about the grade, it's probably fine adult or adult because if it were super fine kid mohair, they would let you know. So the most common mohair yarn that you see is brushed mohair. And that's where all of these beautiful long hairs are coming out and creating this really nice big halo. And the way that they actually get that effect is that they um, ply the mohair fiber with uh, a binding thread that is often nylon, wool, or silk in this case. Um, and they ply it so quickly that the long mohair fibers actually bend back on themselves and they get trapped again, they make these little loops. And those loops are called the boucle effect. Um, boucle yarn is anything where the fiber has looped back on itself and got caught twice. And that's actually a desirable effect as well. You can find mohair sold that way and you can find other fibers sold that way. And in fact, if you're familiar with the term boucle at all, it is probably from a fabric that is made out of weaving boucle yarns. That's sort of that typical look that you see on like a Coco Chanel suit. Uh, if you Google image boucle or boucle suit, you'll probably recognize it, know exactly what I'm talking about. And they get all those cute little loops on that fiber by applying the yarn really quickly and having it loop back on itself. So first you run it through that. You can then sell that yarn as is, as a mohair boucle, but what is more common is they then run it through another machine that combs out the fibers, undoes the loops, and now you have each of these fibers just sort of coming off. Let me give it, there you go, give it that black background. So really nice big halo. And that is a brushed mohair. That's the most common thing you're gonna see. Um, I find what you see a, a lot of, and the only thing that I really have remembered knitting with in the past, is a lace weight brushed mohair, like the Kid Silk Haze. There are some other companies that do it. Um, and it's really great on its own, but it's also really, really great to layer up with other yarns, as I said, to give them that extra bit of mohair glory. It's, it's strength, it's warmth, and of course, it's beautiful shine and it's lovely, lovely um, halo. However, you'll also find other weights of yarns and you'll find mohair blended with um, other fibers. So, so a lot of times they will blend mohair with wool and the wool adds body and loft and elasticity to the mohair. Here, this just mohair and silk, I mean, it is not elastic at all because neither mohair nor silk is very elastic. But if you blend mohair with wool, you can get a bit of a stretchier, um, loftier, you know, scrunchier kind of situation, which is quite desirable for a lot of garments. Say you want to create a sweater and you want it to be really scrummy, but also have a nice halo, a wool mohair blend might be good for that. Um, silk, which is what it's blended with here, is great for blending with mohair. You see that a lot. And that is because silk gives it a really nice drape, um, but it also has its own shine factor. Like I said, it's pretty much the shiniest fiber you're ever gonna see. So mohair and silk are both really lustrous and shiny. And when you blend them together, you're you know not gonna lose any of that luster that mohair naturally has because the silk has it in spades. So wool and silk are common fibers to be blended with mohair to really show off that mohair, but you'll also find small amounts of mohair being used in other blends because it's bringing things to the table like it's sort of delicate sheen and halo. So you'll see something that's majority wool with a little bit of mohair because it's gonna give some other quality strength, um, warmth, a little bit more warm. Mostly that halo is what you're looking for though, but a, a bit of a sheen as well. Um, yeah, so that's mohair. And the next goat fiber that we're gonna talk about is cashmere. Um, 
Now, cashmere is the downy undercoat of the cashmere goat, and you'll be familiar with this as we talked about in the uh, camelids video, but um, cashmere goats also have uh, guard hairs on the outside, and then they have this lovely downy undercoat, which is desirable for knitters. The cashmere goat is originally from the Himalayas, and it's named after the Kashmir region of India, of course spelled a little bit differently. Um, but little cashmere is produced there now. Now the number one producer is actually China. So China produces two thirds of the world's cashmere products and they also import 50% of the Mongolian cashmere production, which is another big production, um, just to create products in China and then export them. So China kind of used to do a lot of um, exporting the raw fiber itself, but then they figured out they could make more money by, uh, you know, producing it into things like yarn and, uh, and fabric and pashminas and sweaters and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so like I said, the dual coat on the goat is uh, guard hairs mostly, and those can be used for creating brushes and things, um, but you really can't knit with them at all. And then the undercoat has these really short, delicate fibers um, that average only one and a quarter inches to three and a half inches, which is about three to nine centimeters. Um, and they are 15 microns, which is uh, one third the diameter of the finest human hair. So incredibly soft. Um, that's probably the number one thing people know about cashmere is that it's soft and maybe that it's expensive. Um, but let's talk about this. So you know it's soft, right? It is also warmer and lighter than wool and that's very important. That is a huge thing about what cashmere is good for. It is 30% lighter than wool and eight times warmer. Take that in for a minute. Wool, which we know is super warm. <laughs> cashmere is eight times warmer, okay? And lighter. This means you can create a very, very thin layer that does not add weight or bulk and it keeps you warm. For me, that is what I'm about with cashmere. So today to record this video, I put on my favorite cashmere sweater. This is from the company Everlane, which is a really lovely transparent fashion company. And um, this is a very, very thin, uh, you can see the fabric a little bit better. I don't know. But so this is not the kind of thing I could hand it myself because it's even thinner than a lace. Wait, I mean, it's incredibly fine gauge. Very thin fabric. Does not add any bulk at all. It's like wearing a t-shirt. But it is so, 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 so warm. <laughs> and I love that about it. It's soft. Um, it is just a perfect base layer. I don't wear anything underneath of it. And it's one of my very favorite things to wear in the, uh, the colder months. So the other thing um, you might notice just about looking at, looking like, just looking at this, is how matte it is. It's not reflecting any light at all. In fact, it's probably kind of hard to see it because it is black and it's matte. Um, and I find that because of the softness of cashmere, um, it, it is, it's like the opposite of that luminous, shiny uh, silk look. So I can always, without even touching a sweater, because I'm used to it now, I can spot a cashmere sweater like on the other side of the room because nothing else has this matte look to it. Um, this just slightly fuzzy, really soft, just absorbing every bit of light and um, just giving you that really luxurious cashmere look that nothing else looks like. Um, so why is it so expensive? Um, <laughs> that Now you're getting down to the other reason why I have this store-bought thin cashmere sweater instead of um, having knit my own 100% cashmere sweater because it is expensive. And so, yeah, when you're buying a cashmere sweater, it's really, it's nice because it can be thin, it can be like a t-shirt, which is great, but also that's good because it doesn't take as much fibers to make something really thick. And something really thick would probably be too warm anyway. But, um, so why is it so expensive? Well, 
A single, a single goat produces up to a pound of fiber a year, but that includes guard hairs, okay? So when you take away all the guard hairs and you're just talking about the actual cashmere fiber that one cashmere goat produces in an entire year, and you've got about six to eight ounces, which if you are not from the US or you know, you're just a knitter, I think we all think in grams at this point, uh, that's 170 to 227 grams. So it's like a couple skeins of uh, fingering weight cashmere, um, <laughs> like in an entire year, an entire animal. So you're starting to understand why it's, you know, not quite as cheap as wool. <laughs> um, so ha ha here's how the fiber is harvested. So you have this one goat, you're gonna get a couple skeins out of it for the year. And the way that you do that is they molt in the springtime and you actually oftentimes have an individual person hand plucking the cashmere off the goat or else they're using a comb and they're combing the cashmere off the goat. But either way, it really has to be done by hand. And even if you shear the entire fleece using a machine, you sort of save time for that part of the process, but then you have to pick the guard hairs out and that has to be done by hand. And it is more difficult to pick the guard hairs out once the whole fleece has been sheared off, which is why mostly people just hand pluck it or hand comb it in the first place. So individual goats are not producing that much fiber and then it all has to be collected by hand. Um, so, you know, you're starting to understand why it's expensive, but the qualities of it, I think also make it worth the price. You just need to understand what it's good for. Use it for those things. Um, be delicate with it, you know, and you can get your full money's worth out of it. It's, it's just one of those precious things that um, really, I think, lives up to the hype, but you have to understand how you're using it. And that's part of why I wanted to make this video for you guys, because if you're if you're knitting with cashmere for this um, the land of goats, then you know you want to know more about what makes it so special, right? So the um, the fiber is very fluffy, very soft, almost like this powdery quality to it, right? And um, because of that, to sort of enhance that, it's often woolen spun, um, which Woolen and worsted are two different ways of spinning yarn. Worsted is unrelated to worsted weight, so that's a different thing. But worsted or woolen spun means if it's worsted, all the fibers are sort of combed out and they're all going the same direction. And that's a stronger, but less, um, it's a stronger, denser, heavier yarn. The worsted, they're all jumbled up in different directions. That gives you a fluffier, loftier, lighter, warmer um, yarn that is not as uh, not as strong, okay? Cashmere, often woolen spun, because that's just enhancing its natural properties. It is not a strong fiber. It is a fluffy, soft, warm, light uh, fiber. And so woolen spun is you're just leaning into all of the stuff that's going on with cashmere already, okay? Um, and you guys, that means it pills like crazy. Okay. It pills a lot. I have little pills. Every time I wear this, I'm like picking tiny little pills out of my armpits because nothing feels like cashmere. It's loose. It has these very short fibers. They're woolen spun. That is just part of what you're getting into. Um, so you should know that. And that makes it a little bit unfortunate with things like sweaters because you do rub your arms here and so they're gonna pill here. It's not that big of a deal if you're just doing like a lovely little cashmere cowl or something. That's not getting a lot of wear and tear. So pilling isn't gonna be that big of a deal. And the other thing about the wear and tear, um, because it's loose and delicate, fibers are getting pulled out. That's what creates pills, right? So it stands to reason that it also wears thin more easily than other things. So 100% cashmere socks, probably not a great idea. Unless you're just gonna put them on while you like lie on the couch and not actually even walk around in them, which sounds pretty luxurious and I would like that. That sounds really good actually. Um, so yeah, 
if you're doing like an MCN blend for socks, for example, that's fine, that's cool. They're gonna be super warm and cozy and very luxurious, but they're definitely gonna pill and they're definitely gonna wear out faster than your just merino nylon sock yarn. That's just the situation. Um, other thing is, it's, it's not gonna be super wash. There's not a process of making cashmere super wash. Um, so it's bringing that to the table and that's where we're gonna have a little bit of a show and tell. And I haven't shown this on the show yet because I keep forgetting to, but something sad happened. Don't freak out, it's not the end of the world. But this is my um, pavement sweater that I knit earlier this year. And I knit it out of an MCN yarn and that's a merino cashmere nylon blend. And uh, it accidentally got in the washing machine with hot water. Now the merino was super wash, nylon is fine. It didn't even have that much cashmere in it, but everywhere it was matting. And you can see some of the little places where it's still screwed up. I had to pull it apart. It's got a bunch of pills on it that I still need to come off, but it is all these weird little places here, you can probably tell better, where it was trying so hard to felt. Just the little bit of cashmere that's in here, I think it's 10%, was trying to felt this whole sweater by itself. It was convinced that it was gonna be able to felt. Here, it's screwed up here. So this sweater, it fits a little bit differently now, and it's got these weird little screwy places on it. It was really, it was really sad. It took a lot of work for me to even just pull apart all the places where it was trying to stick itself together. And I still need to comb off all of these big pilly areas. Um, and once I've done all of that, it's not gonna be quite like new, but I think it's still gonna be wearable. So word to the wise, <laughs> Merino cashmere nylon blends are 10% non-superwash, which means the whole thing is non-superwash. Keep that out of your washing machine because it will go badly. So that's my warning <laughs> on cashmere, even when it's mixed with majority superwash fiber. Um, so cashmere is often blended. Talking about an MCN, that's a very common cashmere blend. It is often blended and it makes sense because A, it's extremely expensive, so 100% cashmere is going to be hard to afford. And B, it has so many beautiful qualities that it can bring to other blends of yarn, even in small amounts. This MCN sweater, it's only 10% cashmere. It feels incredibly soft, so much softer than plain merino, just that 10% makes a big difference. And this is part of the reason why for the land of goats, um, it is okay to use a yarn with as little as 10% cashmere. For camelids, it was like we wanted the majority of the yarn uh, to, to be that fiber. Um, but with cashmere, I think it's okay. You're still experiencing what cashmere is bringing to the table. And this is a really, really common way that cashmere is used in modern knitting. And so, you know, I think part of understanding the fiber is understanding its place and 100% cashmere yarn, while it does exist and it is glorious and I would love to live vicariously through anyone who wants to knit with that um, for the cow, um, that's not the majority of what you're gonna see out there. You're mostly gonna see blends and you're often gonna see the cashmere being the minority of the blend because it's still bringing so much to the table and you're still gonna get a lot out of that. 10% cashmere is going to be an incredibly luxurious, wonderful fiber to knit with. Absolutely recommend it. Um, so, it's blended with other fibers. What are some of those blends? What are you gonna see? Um, Merino is going to add elasticity, loft, uh, and durability to cashmere. So 100% cashmere socks don't make a lot of sense, even if you only wear them on the, on the sofa, just because they're not going to be very elastic and you need your socks to be elastic. Um, Merino cashmere nylon blend for socks, 
that's gonna make a little bit more sense. It's bringing that elastic and it's bringing some durability so you might actually be able to wear those uh, in shoes and everything. They won't last as long as non-cashmere socks, but you know, it's, it's doable. Um, you also see silk blended with cashmere a lot and um, silk, for one thing, it adds strength uh, which is something that cashmere is lacking and it also adds shine which is something that cashmere is lacking now Like I said, I really like this beautiful incredibly matte look um, But if you want a little bit of shine and you're not into the totally matte look for your project Silk is going to be a great option to add in there um, Alpaca adds weight and drape cashmere as I said is extremely light uh, much lighter than wool which itself is lighter than alpaca. So an alpaca cashmere blend is a great thing because alpaca can often be too heavy. Uh, it's not appropriately heavy for certain projects. You know, you add cables, you're getting even more going on. Sometimes it can pull out of shape because it's just too much. Adding some cashmere in there is a great way to lighten up your alpaca. Um, and sometimes you'll see it blended with acrylic. Now, I don't really understand this because Acrylic, what you're really about with acrylic is you're either trying to save money or you're trying to go with something that is um, easy to wash. As soon as you add cashmere, you're spending more money and it's not easy to wash. So I've seen cashmere blended with acrylic and I personally feel like it's kind of more of a marketing ploy than anything else. I think it's a way of selling people something and going, hey, this is cashmere, isn't it so soft and it's affordable. Um, but I don't think personally that it makes a ton of sense. Um, but if that's your thing, that's your thing. And uh, yeah, as I said, the superwash situation isn't really possible. So you do see it blended with superwash yarns like acrylic and superwash uh, wool. Um, but cashmere can't be superwash. So you're kind of losing your superwash ability as soon as you're blending it with cashmere. So yeah, that is the lovely cashmere. Um, now, the last thing I wanna, I wanna say after you know mohair and cashmere in terms of, of these different fibers is there are some other goats that give fiber and uh, those are also qualify you for this um, cow. You don't have to use mohair or cashmere. Those are just gonna be the most common that you're gonna come across. There is also a goat called the Kashgora, which is a blend of mohair and cashmere. It's technically um, a quarter angora goat and three quarters cashmere goat. Um, it's not very common, but you might find that. You might want to use it. Uh, the pigora is a cross between a pygmy goat and an angora goat. That's out there. And um, pashmina is also a type of goat used for their fiber. However, uh, the term pashmina was so commonly used to refer to a certain style of wrap or scarf. Um, that the term kind of lost its official meaning and at least in the US no fiber can legally like there's no legal definition for what pashmina means in terms of a fiber um, but it might be different in other places so any goat fiber that you want to knit with is cool um, mohair and cashmere are the main ones and so last I want to talk um, a little bit about as I did with the camelids my project, um, the prize, and my past experience sharing a, an object that I've made with a, a goat fiber. So what I'm working on is probably honestly gonna be still the Laura Lee, which does have 10% cashmere in it, just because um, it's not uh, finished yet <laughs> and it works. Um, so I might just push that into, into next uh, the next period of the cowl. Um, however, I did have a plan for another project that I might um, do. I'm not sure. And that is the um, Puffed Sleeve Feminine Cardigan, which is by, um, that is by Stephanie Jappel, and it's from the book Fitted Knits. And I have yarn to make it, um, just a solid black, Knit Picks Capra. Uh, so that was sort of my plan. I don't know if that's gonna get done or if I'll do it some other time um, But that was originally my plan for this and uh, Capra is a yarn that I recommend so 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 highly uh, It's a DK weight 85% um, merino 15% cashmere for, Because it's from knit picks. It's a fairly affordable option and because it's only 15% cashmere that helps as well 
Uh, so it is insanely soft. Obviously Merino is extremely soft anyway. Then you get your 15% cashmere, which is really um, generous. And it is just a joy. I have used it for several projects in the past. It's one of my favorite um, commercial yarns, one of my favorite yarns, period, probably. Um, I would love to do a full sweater out of it at some point. And um, I purchased enough to do uh, this particular sweater, which um, we'll see if that happens now or sometime later. But uh, there are lots of full sweaters, full DK weights. In fact, every time I see a DK weight sweater, my mind immediately goes to Capra because it is just such a lovely yarn. So if you are looking for a suggestion, you have nowhere to begin, um, I would definitely recommend that. But there's lots of great options out there. Um, and for the prize, um, I believe that I'm going to, to go with, uh, something that a lot of people will find a use for, which is something like this, either the Rowan Kitzel case or possibly Shibui has a similar version. Um, I have not purchased it yet. I want to go to my local yarn store and, uh, there's one that has both this and Shibui. They might have some other brands and I kind of want to feel them side by side because I only personally have experience with this one. So if I buy the Shibui, I just want to make sure that I like it as much as this. Um, if that's going to be the one that we're going to give away. So uh, I still need to buy that, but this something similar to this is what you're going to be getting. It's extremely versatile. You can use it by itself. It's wonderful to hold doubled with other yarns to bring some mohair to the party. Um, I used it held double in my uh, Marled Magic. Stephen West loves adding just a little bit of mohair himself with a Kitzel case or something similar to his patterns. Um, and I also used it held double for this project, which is my example of um, my past knitting in a way that you can use goat fiber. So this is my everyday hat. Uh, it is called the Sugar Cane and it's by City Pearl. And I knit this earlier this year and I did it held double with Rowan Kitzel Kays, uh, which is this guy, and Rowan's Finest, which is a fingering weight. Um, it's been discontinued now but it is a fingering weight, 50% merino, 30% alpaca, 20% cashmere. Um, and then the Rowan Kitzel case is the fingering weight and that's the cashmere and the silk. So all of that together, the fingering gives it this nice body and then the, the Kitzel case, as you can see, it has this really, really lovely um, halo all around it. And because the fingering weight is a cashmere blend with merino and alpaca, all of which are extremely soft, and then the kid silk haze is a super fine baby alpaca, which is the softest mohair you can get, this hat is perfectly soft and not scratchy at all, which is really important to me when it comes to a hat or anything else that's gonna be next to the skin. If this was scratchy right here on my forehead, I wouldn't wear it, I would hate it. So um, yeah, I think that, I mean, in my experience, mohair, um, using a lace weight and holding it in with other things, that's the main way I've done it, the main way I've seen a lot of people use it. Um, so yeah, that's my example, but there's so much more you can do with it. And of course, there's a ton to be done with cashmere. So I'm really excited to see what all you guys get up to um, and make sure that you, post your uh, FOs in the thread, do your um, your fun uh, chatter, and I'm just really excited to get started. So um, I will see you there.